Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, Ryan is coming with some really great news today. One, we have the largest DeFi hack in, in history to date. Um, $600 million worth of crypto plus taken, as well as the U.S. just passed the the massive infrastructure bill that everybody's been paying attention to. Um, Ryan and I were watching the votes on the floor as this went through. Uh, you know, he's going to go into detail in what happened to the bill from its initial proposal and the effects of it to what was finally passed and what those effects are going to mean for crypto in the U.S. Um, but also, we got to remember that crypto is bigger than the U.S., so this is just one market, but we'll dive into those details. First, I just want to get out of the way. Anything, uh, Trade the Chain, Ryan, myself, we talk about, we analyze, we vocalize uh, or discuss are completely just our opinion alone. Um, they're not financial advice. They're not to be taken as such. We're purely here for your education, amusement and entertainment. Um, Ryan, the news, dude, today is huge. Yeah, we have a couple of, thanks, Alex. We have a couple of really um, relevant stories uh, that could have significant impacts, not only on crypto markets uh, in the short term, but th the entire industry as a whole in the long term, right? The pipes, the platforms, the picks, the shovels, everything that underpins the industry is, I wouldn't say under threat, but there's a bit of uncertainty hanging over it in the U.S. from between now and 2023 when the provisions that have been inserted into this infrastructure bill uh, would take effect. So let's just break down what happened before we get into uh, the specifics of the bill. So every not everyone, but many people are aware that today Congress voted or Senate voted to pass a one point two trillion dollar infrastructure bill in that bill you have. 500 some million dollars for roads, for broadband internet. You have another 700 million allocated to other priorities of the Biden administration because let's face it, US's infrastructure is crumbling. Overall, this is a bipartisan effort. Many people are in favor of it. However, about five days into the process, Senator Rob Portman, a Republican from Ohio, inserted some crypto specific provisions into the bill, just kind of shoehorned them in saying, well, we'll find $28 billion from this by raising taxes. And the whole uproar from the crypto community was the definition of a broker, right? In crypto, the way Portman, who clearly doesn't understand the, how the blockchain and crypto asset industry works, he brought in the definition of a broker to include miners, to include liquidity providers, DEXs, to include uh, nodes, node operators, software developers, non-custodial wallets, you name it. Right. If the definition were limited just to traditional broker dealers and exchanges such as they operate in crypto versus the way they operate in traditional markets, you know, those entities largely are playing by the rules. They're doing tax reporting. They're doing KYC. They're doing all the right things, the ones that are operating in the U.S. at least most of them anyway. And that would not have been a major change to business. However, if you start including node operators and non-custodial wallets and liquidity pools, DEXs, a lot of these entities, you know, they don't know who each side of a transaction is. And that's the whole point of the crypto industry. So levying tax reporting capabilities on them not only potentially kills the mining industry in the U.S. because there's nothing for miners to report, right? They're earning rewards. I heard a conversation earlier today where it was similar to airline miles, right? Airline miles are awarded for activity. Bitcoin is awarded for activity. Other cryptos are awarded for activity based on what they do on the network, right? There is a little bit of a difference in that the activity, the rewards earned can go up in value, but you're doing activity to earn rewards, right? So there's no real need for tax reporting there. It's not a capital event. And node operators, they don't know who is on either side of a transaction. They can't do that. So the crypto industry was up in arms because it's not technically possible to meet these requirements, right? So the next day, Senators Ron Wyden, Cynthia Loomis, and Pat Toomey, a uh, Democrat and two Republicans, proposed an amendment exempting what they saw as non-broker entities. So basically all of those concerns were wiped away from based on their amendment and it only included exchanges and broker dealers. This is great, this was good. And then there was another uh, amendment uh, proposed 
that kind of narrowed the scope, but still left it a little open-ended. That came from uh, Senators Mark Warner and Kristen Sinema, two Democrats themselves, and it, it, it exempted only proof-of-work minors, but it was also taken to mean node operators, what have you, right? Which is largely the same thing. So it was a step in the right direction. Senate resumed con consideration of the bill, and then you need unanimous support. Well, that unanimous support, after the amendment was announced yesterday morning by Senator, I think, Toomey, Alex? Yeah, no, no you're right. Okay. Yeah. Senator, this is a great story. I, I'm <laughs> Senator Toomey announced it, and it needs unanimous support to support an amendment to a bill, right? Well, it had everyone's support except for one person who shall not be named. He um, wanted $50 billion extra for the military. They get $750 billion a year already. And basically because he didn't get what he wanted, he took his ball and went home. Scuppered the whole agreement, sent it down, and the bill that was voted on today and sent to the House for final approval included the original provisions that everyone in the crypto industry is so concerned about. Alex, the implications could be massive here. Yeah. Uh, basically what you just said, I mean, listen, I thought over the weekend when they when they were, first of all, I was happy to see them working on a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but w over the weekend, I thought we were getting rid of a lot of that stuff that was going to be detrimental, right? We're used to the brokers and the exchanges yeah. having to conform. But to your point, node operators and stake, staking pools and DEXs, that's impossible. That's, that's like 100% you have to leave the U.S. or not operate here. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people who either are anti-crypto or don't understand the industry, they fire back at anyone complaining about this on Twitter saying, oh, you just don't want to pay taxes. No, the vast majority of people do want to pay taxes and they don't mind paying taxes. It's not about taxes. It's about feasibility and technological possibility. Right. And whatever the rules are, the industry will will adapt however is necessary, or they'll play regulatory arbitrage and jump around to different um, jurisdictions like uh, some of the more prominent exchange heads have done. But at the end of the day, the majority of the industry will adapt. And there is a silver lining here, right? This isn't the end of the road. It doesn't take effect until 2023, and nothing in the bill is binding law, right? So this is guidance for the Treasury Department and the IRS to put together rules that get signed into law. And there is plenty of time for the industry to interact with, you know, and constituents to interact with the Treasury Department, with the IRS, with lawmakers that can help potentially influence that process. And ultimately, we may still net out where we want to as an industry, but there's that uncertainty that everyone's worried about. There is time, though. This isn't taking effect tomorrow or this year or even next year. It's not, it's not a black swan event. Not by any stretch. Everyone will know it's coming from a mile away. You know, and that's one of the things, without going down the, uh, uh, delving down the road of politics too much, you see how long this is taking to uh, effectuate, right? The process mm -hmm. is years long. I mean, in some cases, it can be a midterm for an administration and go into the next administration. Yeah, I never quite understood. I feel like sometimes there's not enough time in uh, terms, in in order to get stuff done without first being reversed, you know, I feel like. Oh my God, the one oppo op opposing senator to this bill, he's eighty six years old. His term, he's retiring at the end of his current term, so it doesn't. He won't even be in office when this bill takes effect. He's just <laughs> burning down the house for the sake of burning down the house. Did it's anybody wonderful. tell him that? A 101-year-old company, AMC uh, Movie Theaters, is actually now going to take Bitcoin for uh, tickets. That's a, That company's older than him. He couldn't conform. <laughs> I mean, that's that's quite a feat to be older than that guy. Um, but, <laughs> I mean, just because you're old doesn't mean you, you can't understand something, right? Like, my father was 75 years old before he passed away last year, and he was on the Internet every day, right? So, you know, you, being old doesn't preclude you from being able to adapt and learn and understand, he just doesn't care. And since he doesn't care, he's just hitting a group of people that he doesn't realize. There are families, there are businesses, there are thousands of people employed, tens and hundreds of thousands of people employed, real revenue generating, tax paying companies in this space that he's harming. And it's just, to him, it's all just dirty internet money probably. He thinks it's all Silk Road and all this other stuff. And it just, it's disappointing, I think, short-sighted. Well, I mean, let's, you know, the one 
the one group that needs to think about the future sooner than the others uh, that are lumped into this bill are miners, right? So we just yes. went through the whole China ban. Um, there was a big exodus of mining uh, companies moving out of there, and a lot of them to the United States um, yes. based on yes. our laws. Yeah, and, and our electricity costs and stuff like that. Now, these guys spend a lot of money setting up their centers. So they actually have to think about uprooting again as a possibility. Am I, I mean, right? So there are two schools of thought on that, right? Mining generations only last for so long, these ASICs, right? So they could worry about uprooting the equipment they have and moving, or they could look at this as, well, we have at least a year and a half, if not two years. Why don't we just plan for the next generation to be somewhere more hospitable and we run this generate we wind this generation down here through its natural life cycle? And that makes sense to me, right? Uh, I would also say, you know, you have at least a year until this current generation of A6 is completely obsolete. A lot can happen in a year. We always say how a week in crypto is a month in the traditional markets. Well, we have two years. So what is that? Five years in uh, traditional markets? I mean, there's plenty of time. In dog year, in crypto years, we'd be eighty-seven years old by that time. Probably. No <laughs> hair be gray, gray head. No, no hair All right. So nothing. You know, uh, kind of a bad day uh, as far as just the mood on Capitol Hill, but nothing that's going to take immediate effect that we need to worry about now. And there's still a lot of road to travel um, before this really impacts anybody. Um, so okay, good with that. And also, surprisingly, yeah. Alex, right, um, not to get into technical analysis or anything, but the market's valuations have held up. Bitcoin's, you know, hovering around 45,000. Ethereum's still over 3,000. It shows the resiliency in the markets and the belief that people have that even if there is a storm cloud hanging over, and there's another one we're about to talk about, that would have previously sent the markets down dramatically. It would have been a flash crash. And we're yeah. not having that now. This is a real industry and the government trying to tax it and generate revenue from it shows that it believes that it has staying power and that it believes it will grow. So we're, it's here to stay. Whether the U.S. government wants it to or not, it'll just it'll adapt or move at the end of the day. All right. Let's jump into the big news of the day because it's one for the record books, uh, Ryan. Mm -hmm. I mean, six hundred million plus dollar crypto massive DeFi uh, hacker attack. What happened? And prominent. Yeah, Poly Network is one of the largest um, DeFi networks currently in operation. And they were breached for $611 million uh, at last count. And it wasn't just limited to one protocol on the Poly Network. It was across Binance Chain, Ethereum, and uh, Polygon Network. Right, so the breakdown here is 273 million of Ethereum tokens, 253 million on Binance Smart Chain, and another 85 million in USDC on Polygon. Right, so Tether has already blacklisted the Ethereum stolen in the attack that was uh, the USDT on Ethereum that was stolen. That's about 33 million of tokens. So they can't be moved at all. Those, the, the hackers well, lost that. If I'm not mistaken, any stablecoin uh, company can do that to a stablecoin. That's correct. Yes, that's my belief as well. And so that, sure, 33 million. All right, goodbye. So what's that still remaining? $578 million? I think I could live with that, right, from the hackers. But, you know, the, you can track the, the, the transactions and blockchain security firms are already on it and they have the attacker's ID and it has all their information. And they're going, they, they might be able to recover this money, surprisingly. But um, it's not a good day. The fact that this can still happen is, especially when Capitol Hill is looking at how to better regulate crypto. If this happened two years from now, when crypto is, you know, more clearly re regulated, I could see there being a problem for, you know, Poly Network or uh, other breached uh, uh, platforms. You know, that there have to be some kind of sanctions, just like there are in other cases like this in other industries. Well, let's tie let's tie the two stories together, right? So here we have this this massive uh, breach of um, the network. It, it, it's so much money. It's people's money, right? Is do they have any? There's no remedy for that. 
um, unless it's recovered, which is a long shot. I mean, I, I think I saw CZ from Binance put out a tweet earlier today that, you know, listen, there's no assurances of anything being done, but we are aware of the addresses and are, are doing what we can on our side to kind of blacklist uh, certain things. But really, it's the people who just got screwed. Maybe. The hacker doesn't seem to even want the money. And according to the blog, a, a transaction from one of the wallets containing the stolen funds uh, included a message that said, in all caps, it would have been a billion hack if I had removed remaining shit coins. Did I just save the project? Not so interested in money, now considering returning some tokens or just leaving them here. He doesn't even want the money. He just did to prove he could. That's some flex, dude. That is, that's a nice flex. <laughs> um, I mean, it would be nice for him to return the money, though. Uh, I mean, because, you know, going back to regulation, um, you know, the U.S. and I'm sure other other countries as well, I won't speculate, but there's some regimes that are, you know, just as tight like the U.K. and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, which where, you know, in... There has to be some sort, not necessarily insurance, but assurance of, of you know, how you operate a business and, you know, th things of that nature. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and the wallets, the one thing to consider here, which made it easy to track this guy down or this thief down, was that the wallets have interactions with centralized exchanges, including FTX, Binance, OKX, KuCoin, and the hacker actually underwent KYC. So they know who he is. They're going to find him. They've they already literally him. have his ID and stuff. Like from everything. Country. That company Slow Mist not only has the attacker's ID, they have his email address, IP information, and device fingerprint, and that the attacker's original funds were in Monero, which were exchanged for BNB, ETH, and Matic, and other tokens that were used to fund the attack. Again, this is all coming from the Blocks article, which was by far the most detailed and uh, the best um, best account of what happened. This is remarkable. So there's there's a chance that he could actually get caught by law enforcement then. He will be. Now, if he returns the money beforehand, he could just claim he was a white hat hacker and he did it for fun. And he'd probably get away with it. And he probably at six hundred million dollars, he'd probably get a nice reward, too, as a white hat hacker. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll see. <laughs> Um, does this, in your mind, because with with me, I'm not even digesting this yet, and you and I deal in crypto every day, um, moving funds across the, the blockchains um, and across mm -hmm. bridges, but how does this make you feel? I mean, personally, with your own money. I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about that, you know, because we, we do interact with a lot of DEXs. And, you know, we know the project heads and, you know, the ones that we talk to, they're good people. That doesn't mean they're immune to these types of hacks, though. Yeah. And a lot of them use the same chains. They use Binance Chain. They use Polygon. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just hope I'm not one of the people who's a victim. I. Yeah. No, I know? mean, this is, also, this is also coming on the heels of ThorChain, right? And, um you know, we, we saw what happened there. So it, it, it does make things a little, a little skeptical, I guess. Um, but sketch is the word very sketchy <laughs> <laughs> folks. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, definitely, uh, first of all, uh, go try us out, trade the chain.com. You can find Ryan and myself there in our, uh, in our discord community with all the mm -hmm. other members. Um, and, 14 day risk free, as well as uh, 23 time zones. We have members in. So 23. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan likes to shout that out. That's his, <laughs> story. That's his thing. Um, so definitely check us out there. Uh, don't forget to watch, uh, obviously, Indianapolis this weekend. We have Landon mm -hmm. Castle racing at IMS. Um, and the Marker Rebellion guys are going to be fielding a car there too. So we got a little, we got a little rivalry going on, uh, Ryan. So excited about that! Absolutely, we're taking those guys down. <laughs> <laughs> also, some things um, from Trade the Chains governance and reward token, uh, cent token. Um, don't forget. 
that it, it is now uh, listed on Hippie DC, um, as well as yesterday was just listed on Loopring, uh, L2 Exchange. Um, and we got a bunch of another announcements. Well, I mean, it was, it's already disclosed to so tell you that uh, next week, um, uh, mining uh, liquidity is coming to uh, for the cent token at Loopring. So that's exciting stuff as well. Again, hang on to your handlebars, guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe on your way out the door. Thanks, everyone.